I'm here at the brewery. We smoke that. We have the art walks uh, twice a year. If you're trying to find me, I'm the corner. Over here is the five. And uh, I am right up there where we're going to go now. Here's the Burton Gray Studio. My main area. We're looking at a piece behind you. Uh, this is a skull. This has been around a couple of years. Um, so this is one of my more popular pieces. It's um, I'm digital, so I do variations. Down here's a black and white version. Um, do you do uh, do you do printed uh, editions uh, like of the skull? How many of the skull are available, or is it an infinite edition? I call them living editions. So I basically they're like snapshots. So whenever you want it, that's what's ever where I'm at. So it's it's one of a kind because after you sell it to me, you, you're gonna do some more work on it. Yeah, quite often. Basically, there's two versions. There's the ones made by me, which I do in here and printed here, mounted back there, and stamped in the bottom right corner. Well, it's embossed. It's kind of subtle. But I do that in this machine here. Comes across, but so like oh, yeah. studio origins. Bit of a watermark yeah. there. I see it. I see it. So basically, there's the high quality ones I do in house. I coat them and mount them to like these wood panels, and the backs are dated and they're stamped and coated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and I stain or paint them. This was like an early version of my green tree, and that's like the current version. So you can see how they evolve with time sometimes. Correct me if I'm wrong. They they also change size. Because it's always in flux, I don't do like this set edition. So it's complicated. So like case in point, this one I added like gold detail for someone. Um, so is that is that commission based though? Does somebody say ahead of time, I like this skull, I wish you could put some gold on it for me? Yeah, this case it was. Although usually I don't always do that unless I like the idea. I'm digital painter. One of the most attractive aspects for me is that I can keep working on the piece indefinitely so they can evolve with time. But ever since I've been like a selling artist, I've been digital painting. When did you switch to digital? Last term at Art Center, I had to take a computer class to graduate. So I took like a landscape painting class. So that's the first time I did it. And then um, I don't know, I got into working on the Wacom tablet. And, but back then there was no way to print it or do anything because the technology wasn't there yet and the RAM was slow. So what, what year are we talking? Uh, we're talking or 2003 or four, maybe five. So oh, wow. a little while ago. Um, and then, but sure, then the Epson printers came out and they could print pigment based inks and the RAM started catching up so I could do multiple layers. By 2008, I basically abandoned oil painting altogether and went all digital. Does the Wacom have its own software or is there extra software that you add on this or is it just 100% Wacom? I do this all in Photoshop. This is a good example. That's why I have this out for like the advantage of digital painting. So basically it's like 20 little landscape paintings that I could like combine into one big piece which would be not practical to do an oil paint. Also, it'd be hard to make the greens work in oil painting. And how many years have you been working on this one? I haven't worked on it for a few years. When people find you, can you just, you could start working on any one of them. Like if somebody saw that uh, in this video and said, oh, I love that, but it could, could, you, could you add a, a, a different piece of architecture to it? You could, you could just pick up where it is now and I add could, something but to I mean, it. If I like the idea, I'll do it. My goal is to make the piece work in their space. I want them to have the right experience. That's the most important thing for me. This one is a life cycle piece. So it starts with like a guy coming in with a fairy and it's like the first landscape is kind of childlike. And as you go up through it, it gets less childlike. Um, there's like a tree house and then a real house. As you keep going, there's a mausoleum. And then the path turns into water and the water turns into eventually light and like from light back to, so like from whence he came sort of thing. So if they wanted like, their dream house or something, I could theoretically paint their house, but I'm not going to paint a house down here, so to speak, because that's where childhood. So, but if they like, oh, my childhood memory, I had a pet dog with a black spot. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. I, that would help enrich this piece for you based on the concept of the piece. What percentage of people are the ones who say, add a little something and the others who say, you know, give me the latest version and, and I trust you as an version. artist. Most, Most people, the they, they, they trust you yeah. as an artist. Generally speaking, since it's 2021, and since you did talk about the idea of less things being touched, are you into this NFT craze at all? Well, I just started getting into it. We'll see where it goes. The advantage to digital is essentially everyone is an original because that they're painted and computer to be printed. 
Um, but you're still you're still existing in the physical world here. A lot of these NFT artists are like, it's digital only. This is the JPEG. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Anymore. Philosophically, I'm about images on a wall. And of course, I'm creating this in the digital world. So it wouldn't be a big jump for me. When you were at Art Center and, and maybe into today, are there any artists from the cl from classical history or from more recent history that uh, you consider to be not only in influenced, but look at your art as maybe in some kind of historical lineage? So yeah, I'm always looking at like art historical things that I see myself as being in like that that line. I'm probably more of a symbol symbolist, I suppose, but I mean, surreal to some degree. One of the labels that's out there for work uh, that I would at least say is similar to yours, and it's not necessarily the label I would use, but a lot of people do, is pop surrealism. I'm sure you've heard this label before. Yeah, I've heard that term. Uh, so I'm really trying to have like qu seemingly quiet images that are still, but they trigger your brain. You have an intuitive process, obviously, but but it, the, the technical skill is so, it's so front and center that people just assume that there's also this this complete verbal logic behind it. Whereas you're, 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 you're working beyond language in a lot of ways, I would say. Yeah, like you? if I wanted, when I was selling art at these fairs, people always want to know your thought process. And it, it starts off like clunky and then it gets more and more refined and it gets, it's, more, it's probably less, and less accurate to what was actually happening when I painted it, but it's probably more truthful in the sense that that's probably where my brain was at, but I wasn't thinking about that when I was doing it. So like my, the robots, when they, when they just had eyes, they're like doing things and they're usually kind of depressed. I was depressed at the time because I was doing graphic design all the time, I was always inside. I'm kind of an extrovert, but my lifestyle is always introverted. It just feels like we're robotic a little bit, or we have like, we're more distance. So it's just a weird sensation that, so that's why I explore that idea in the set of robots um, and in the different contexts, they're all basically different genres. Like the rope, probably my best selling piece is probably the robot at the bar or this is a probably popular piece. Um, whenever I'm dealing with that idea of how that affects our brain and how like it changes, how it slightly distorts our reality, I deal with the set of robots in different contexts, but I don't, but if I want to make money, I probably just do a hundred robots at different bars drinking different drinks because he's so popular and was like, oh, do you have another robot at a bar? Like, so, so, the, so, so the robot's alcoholism could be very successful for you. Everyone wants my norm at the bar and they make requests for other robots drinking different drinks, doing whatever, but apparently- what, what, everyone, uh, Like you, you got a rum and Coca-Cola and they want a daiquiri. I mean- you, Yeah, I mean, he's drinking whiskey. It won't work if he's wearing a martini. Uh, let me ask you something. You grew up in Southern California? I did. Uh, what part of town did you grow up in? I grew up in Palos Verdes. So um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a lot like this. It's really- <laughs> Very vertical. It is. It really affected my whole like aesthetic experience. So I, I really like the idea of like forms built over forms and I love blushes of greens and then um, high contrast. So you have the softness with the sharp, like soft um, vertical down of like the cliffs to like horizontal of the oceans. So then you went to Art Center, um, and now you're at the brewery. Is it is it interesting to live among other artists? Do you interact a lot with the neighbors? No, not really. We all keep to ourselves. I mean, I know that people that do what I do, you know, the other printmakers and some, and some of the other couple of oil painters, but like photographers, if they're not like my neighbors, I'm probably not that familiar with them. Everybody's basically isolated in their own studio making their most, art. I mean, they're, they're busy working artists. artists. Are, yeah, A, that, and B, most artists are very introverted. Like I'm... I can be extroverted, but no one else is. So there's not a lot of like parties, like where everyone gets together. It's just, there's not, there's none of that really going on. Um, so everybody's working. So you do the brewery art walk. Uh, if they get it going again after the lockdown ends, uh, you do the, I, I, we, didn't I interview you at the LA art show back in 2018? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. We had a, we had an interview show there, the modern art blitz show. And uh, you, you, you seem to do well there. Do you do, do you do great at the Beverly Hills? Uh, at the I Beverly, Beverly. They used yeah. to call it the Affair in the Garden. I think it's the Beverly Hills Art Show now. I mean, uh, so so uh, so you enjoy the Beverly Hills crowd? Beverly Hills crowd is, yeah, really good to me. Art walks are my best because people have come to my studio. Um, but the next best was Beverly Hills. And then after that, I really like Venice, just being on the boardwalk because it's beautiful. Wow. So you're going to do a demonstration for us? I'll do a quick demo. All right, so this is a painting I did recently. It's kind of got multiple layers. So it's like a few gigabytes. Um, so just the showcase, just one example. So in this case, like here's a pink tail and then there's like just a bunch of different variations. So again, 
the nature of digital is like it's quick. Actually, let me illustrate how quick it can be. But it's just like an oil painting. Uh, this isn't gonna be a masterpiece, but um, you'll get a sense of. how basically just in some ways it's faster. That was a lot faster than oil painting. Um, well, setup is a lot faster. If I had edge control, this would be a little bit better, faster. But um, yeah, ultimately it's, to do it, it's faster, but you end up painting like 20 times. So I, I can show you like everyone, those figures, there's like 20 versions of them. Some of them are subtle. So I'm like repaint, repaint, repaint. But ultimately, you know, you can see it's basically, and then I'm obviously rushing it. I would spend a lot, it's in the oil paint, it's just as fast. It's just, it's more permanent in oil paint. So you would not paint as fast because you got to get it right. Here, if I don't like it, I can like change it at any point. I can just duplicate it, for instance. Um, but let me just make sense, whatever. Get the highlights. Now, again, I'm like skipping some steps here. But like an oil painting, I generally, this is how I work also. So kind of black and white. And um, let's see. And then uh, just new layer of color. So it's like glazing. But obviously I would take, if it was a real painting, I'd be trying to like capture some emotional state of this person, not just a face. Um, right, but what's exciting? So let's say whatever this is. So now let's say I don't like the color, I just take it away. But now where I lose time is now what happens? It's like, oh, yeah, I group this. Um, and now I can go in whole new directions, which you couldn't have done it in an oil painting because it would get muddy. So let's say I'm going to change. Let's see what I want to do. Orange or something. I mean, you just go nuts. Um, I guess the big, the biggest, the point is here is oh, and also just try it in blue. Just brand new layer. Again, an oil painting. Even like digital, I probably spent like thirty minutes on this head before I got to this point. Then I'm like, oh, I think blue would be interesting for whatever reason. So I just do a new layer and you can make it blue, and then. Um,
so it's getting kind of weird and I can let's say I want to go back to being kind of pretty just duplicate I'm wondering what part of this, and, and maybe compared to oil painting, but what part of this is um, in this process is muscle memory? Um, well, a face is a lot muscle memory. Um, that's the other thing. So I'm going fast because I've painted like a fa a lot of faces in like three quarter view for like demos before. So if I'm doing like a you know a figure that I want that's like pulling her arms a certain way, I'm going to be a lot slower and more deliberate. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Although muscle memory, it's hard to say in this case, a lot, but normal process limited amount or less so. Oh, more so for the computer than for uh, like, like, a, like a, like a physical oil painting. Physical oil painting, you almost have to do physical memory. So you do preliminary sketches. So you kind of figure out how it's going to go. But here, like, if I don't like it, I can just like, you know, delete it, you know? Also, um, it's not on top of a background. So I don't have to worry about the edges because I can like fix that at any point. So, I mean, I get the idea for this. So back to here. So like each one of these light, these figures is, you know, separate. And let's see, so like, different versions of her i guess it's all oh, this kind of sell at this point the file is big so i started deleting some of the variations this is not optimal let's see it's a better example she changed a little bit more towards the end um where did she go All right, so like that's like a slightly different, you know, a different subtle expression diff changes. <laughs> I delete a lot. These are like the last two ones. It's kind of subtle. Um, this is where I settled on. I mean, I this is a not awful because again, these files get huge. And before I got to this point, there's like fibers. Does she have different menacing looks to happy looks to not blowing smoke to blowing smoke? And this creature probably had a bunch of different changes. As you can see, because it's kind of quick to test these out, um, I don't know. So you just add that up, and all of a sudden, you spend like a month on a piece. <laughs> wow. Of course, um, the other end of the spectrum, like the Fantasias, it's so like this is the one that. Um, this is a different mindset. So this is like when I do these Fantasias, these ones are the ones that change the most. Um, because basically I'm playing around with color, but again, this is like probably about two weeks, almost solid. And so it's, it's kind of slow. And initially it was like really fast, loose, and I'm going through and tightening this up. And then it's comes down to like, I just, well, how does this work? Um, so I think I like, I'm looking at it the whole, how I want this to work. And then I like zoom in and then I'll start, you know, I want it to be more blue to purple. I'll, in my mind, I'll picture a couple different directions analytically. And then that's when like, I'll start listening to like Columbo or something in the background and then I'll start like making it that new direction. Um, I don't know if this is gonna be interesting to watch this, but this, that, that's the general mindset. So uh, let's say I wanted to shift it. I'm not gonna like this, but let's say I feel like pink might be better. Um, actually, what might be better? Green might be interesting. So I'm gonna, you know. I like obviously I don't like green, but I might try with stripes to break it up. So that when I zoom out, it'll have the, the right energy. And if I like the rough, then I'll go in and tighten it up. You know, um, I don't really like this, but let's say I did like it, then I would start going in and like tightening it up. I might do however I want the energy to flow. Again, these are a different mindset. This is more like musical. So I want it to flow. So I do a lot more like edge. So it's gonna be like in this case, it'd be like hard to 
like soft. So, so is this closer to what one, one might call your version of abstraction? These are, um, yeah, at one point I try to, there are abstract paintings built around a narrative and the narrative. So it's, again, I'm always big on merging the formal elements with like the narrative element. These images, these characters, these narratives, these are all yours. You're not quoting from popular culture. You're not riffing on some meme or some figure we all know. There's no, these are all completely out of your imagination, right? Uh, completely. Uh, the, I mean, obviously the happy face is a variation of that. Something that. that's a, something that exists in popular culture, but for the most part, you are creating your own universe. The Burton Gray universe. Generally speaking, yeah, it's all, my, it's all me. But One the sad the robots are yours, right? Yeah, this is Robots from mine. This is right, Regina Draco. And so, like, this was based on, it's basically the opposite of, like, the all the Christian angel iconography. So I did a figure that's looking inward. So her eyes are closed. She's looking in. The mouth is closed. The snake is looking at it. So it's almost confrontational. So just basically, just like, flipping all those things. You're not riffing on anything. Oh, no, I'm not riffing on anything. I mean, a lot of artists just have so many references that we're supposed to know. And if we don't know them, they, it makes the artists look great. But you're coming up with this stuff on your own. I mean, oh, that to me I, is the impressive factor. How many artworks are we talking about in your oeuvre? There's like the masterworks and then there's like the regular work. I do like paintings all the time. So I probably have like, um, probably like 50 to 100 pieces that are like my masterworks that are can just you, can, can, can you walk us down to that table with a bunch of them on there? Can we see a few uh, more? Oh, I guess technically this... This is based on Breakfast at Tiffany's. That's a long story. It had less to do with that than that sounds. But here's the robot I was talking about, Norm, with his whiskey. I had my animal series. So these are all based on people I knew. Um, this is a popular one. This is based on my grandma. So she was always so called Aline. It's funny, like growing up, she was always like thinking. This one I originally paired with a snake. This was like for a April Fool's Day. I said I was going to. Everyone was complaining my stuff's too dark. So I was going to do a, I was going to do a new style. And everyone freaked out. So I was like, don't relax. This was uh, called Murby. It's based on someone who's like always like on the move and shifty. So it got like a shifty eye. The one I was going to the right, Zombie Lincoln. Oh, I guess that's based on the $5 bill. Uh, <laughs> it's actually, basically it's supposed to be George Clooney wearing Lincoln makeup in the pose of the $5 bill. This is a Meet Venus. So basically it's like the modern, venus there's like a little girl like touching and being affected by like basically like social media stars how they're really curvy and stuff there's like the people like the mom and the grandma like debating it and then like some guy that the docent like not really getting there in time to keep her from like being affected by it uh, this is a popular social media piece uh but in the background so in here i have like some old paintings that influenced me like some dolly reference leonardo da vinci picasso um basically the implied how like these are the things that influenced me as a kid versus he's being shown like social media crap. Oh, here's another Fantasia one. So this was like a mix of different styles. So that's based on the Verity painting. And then that was based on a photograph of um, Wagner. Basically they're contemporary musician uh, composers, but they had very different styles. So Wagner's was very like flamboyant and boisterous and Verity is more classic and clean. It's the robot dying in the beach. I call it transitions. There's the epoxy of the tree. There's Peter. The robot with the broken wing. Um, Peppermint Venus. Um, let's see, zebra is getting popular again. When the when the world gets back to uh, normal, uh, are we going to see you at the uh, Beverly Hills Art Fair? Let's hope so. Oh, here's my greatest hits. So here's a good example of everything I did. <laughs> uh, we'll see you in the out, in the great outdoors. Uh, so thanks, thanks for doing this. Thanks a lot, and uh, I guess good luck, everyone. And th thanks to you, Matt, for going through this. The pleasure was all mine.